so I noticed that when you talk to people about the corona years, it, you know, some people tend, they start to talk about a novel they read in the beginning of the pandemic, and somehow that book ended up uh, mediating their experience of the whole time. Uh, do you have a book of that <laughs> kind? <laughs> well, I, I, I wrote one, so <laughs> I, th I think um, that was how I got through it. Um, and in fact, I, I tend to have a, uh, a slightly fencing relationship with reading when I'm writing, and because my periods of writing are intense and short and interspersed with long periods of not writing, um, I, I sort of keep those activities separate. Um, but yes, for me, and, and in fact, so strangely, um, I conceived of this book in the period before um, uh, life stopped. And in fact, the basis of the book, I, I wanted it to take place in a, in a suspended, <laughs> in, a, in a world where reality had been suspended in some way. And, um, you know, that was what I had started sort of crafting and putting down. And, uh, and then I was sort of looking, <laughs> almost looking out of my window, thinking, hang on a minute, you know, the same thing is happening out there. So uh, it, it was a odd. Um. And because Second Place is a book uh, based on a book by a woman who, Mabel Dodge, who wrote a book about um, her time when D.H. Lawrence uh, visited her, in, stayed with her in New Mexico. And before we start talking about the book, I mean, can you say something about, I mean, D.H. Lawrence, he's always such a presence in your writing. And when I realized that you now finally, you know, wrote a book, not completely about him, but based on him, I was so thrilled. But why is he such an important writer to you? Um, I think he, well, I think he's an important writer to a lot of women writers, um, kind of in spite of <laughs> oneself, uh, because he's also a, a hate figure for a lot of feminists. And um, so it, he, he's a strange mentor to have. Um, but he, uh, the fact that he, he came from um, a working class background, which you know, is an unusual thing in English literature. Um, he, his language, his sentence structures, uh, the way that, that his sentences travel in, in completely unexpected directions um, kind of proves to a person not wanting to write the available male sentence, <laughs> it proves that there, there, there is another kind of sentence. Um, he, he doesn't write with the voice of patriarchy, and um, that's something that, that, yeah, numerous women have thought, okay, I, it's not quite that he's an honorary woman, but, but that his experience of being, um, of, of sort of low status in, in terms of male values um, gives, gives a clue. As, as, as to the possibilities, I guess. And how did you come across, it's quite extraordinary, this book, Lorenzo and Teos. Uh, how did you come across this? Um, I was thinking of writing something about uh, the idea of kind of artistic utopias and, and um, places where people go to, <laughs> to create. And um, this place particularly had... had always interested me because some people that I'm really interested in, like Lawrence and like the painter Marsden Hartley, had, had gone and created there. And, and um, so I was sort of curious about it. And anyway, I, I came, I, I ordered this book, you know, because I, I did a little research and Mabel Dodge Luhan um, was the, the founder and patroness of this artist community. And, um, so I ordered the book, and as soon as I read it, or started reading it, it was, um, yeah, probably more of a kind of thunderbolt experience than, than I've had for a while, because there, there were so many themes that were starting to kind of mass around me um, in, in terms of giving a clue as to where I was going to go and what was coming next. And um, it was hard to conceive of something 
of that next step after the trilogy and and um I was really wondering what kind of form these themes were going to take and um the idea of using a disused book as it were her book was I, I mean I think it is out of print um but completely neglected and forgotten and and so I had this thought that I would um go and live put my book inside this disused book and that that would solve so many problems about the kind of location of of a novel um and the form i mean and now you mentioned the the trilogy because and i'm just going to rewind a little bit because you know this talk has been postponed many times right we were supposed to sit here a year ago on the stage and you know things continued to happen and and during that time three of your books were published in danish um and they basically span a period of 20 years right from a, li a life's work that came out in 2001 and and up to this book and i know that a lot of people sort of for them it became the books that accompanied them during this year and i thought that tonight we could in a way use these books as a kind of platform to 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 try to understand how you developed your thinking about life and literature and their relationship between each other in these years because i think it, it's something quite extraordinary about the way you write your 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 writing life you could say that those two are so closely mm -hmm. connected so we will return to second place but if we go back to a life's work and maybe you could actually start by reading a paragraph, just so everyone gets a sense of the sound of the book. It's here. <coughs> this, is, this is quite a uh, <laughs> unchar uncharacteristically gripping um, <laughs> bit of this book. Um, sorry, I shouldn't <laughs> put my own book down like that. <laughs> just, you'll understand it's hard from this distance to, to go back into into this reality. Um, a few days after my daughter's birth, I go to a concert. I bought the ticket weeks before, not expecting her to come so soon. I have difficulty walking because of my scar, and my grasp of the principles of breastfeeding is still tentative. But nevertheless, I am determined to go. During pregnancy, I had plenty of time to formulate stirring resolutions concerning the maintenance in motherhood of my independence and interests. Fervently imagining myself at parties and gala events, skiing in the Bundeswald, reclining in Mediterranean sunsets, sitting meditatively at my desk, all the while with the baby in a sort of cartoon thought bubble above my head. This state of mind has extended briefly into my daughter's life, like a projection of rock overhanging a cliff. My mother-in-law is to hand to assist with the transaction and appears nervous. Given that I am taking with me the baby's only known source of comfort and nourishment, her resources, should things go wrong, are limited. I scale down my plans and promise to return during the interval. From the phone box halfway down the road, I receive hesitant but favorable reports. At the tube station, too, things appear to be holding steady, and I get on the train. As the stations pass, I feel slightly wild with a mounting sense of wrongdoing, as if I had stolen something. And when I arrive, I hobble up the escalators and fall upon the nearest telephone as if it were an oxygen mask. It's funny reading this, no mobile phones. <laughs> when I get through, the station foyer immediately fills with the tinny, bleating sound of my daughter's cries. My mother-in-law's voice comes faintly through the static. And the sound of crying, strained but emphatic, as if she were filing a dispatch from a war zone. She started crying about 10 minutes ago, she reports, but it seems to help if I let her suck my finger. In the street outside, the traffic honks and roars. People mill around me, passing out into the London night. They are not only ignorant of the strife-torn region in which now I live, they are as remote from it as if it lay on the other side of the world. Should I come home, I shout into the receiver. It's up to you, comes the reply after a pause. I imagine she'll go to sleep eventually. I promise to phone again in five minutes' time from the concert hall. When I do, the news is bad. I rush deliriously home in a taxi, having bizarrely gone out for the evening in order to visit phone boxes in the West End. 
My mother-in-law's lot was no better. She came all the way to London to sit with me, my crying, hungry child while I telephoned her incessantly. <laughs> <laughs> How is it going back into the text 20 years later? Well, I mean, I've obviously been thinking uh, a lot today about um, that relationship um, to this book that um, still seems to be alive. It, it still seems, uh, and you know, that could uh, that could be a a sort of depressing idea in a way <laughs> that, that so little has changed you know in some of some of the the sort of problems of of um, motherhood that i i write about um but i don't think it really is that i i think i guess what i realized was that you know i only was able to write this book because i immediately had another child and it was that return to to the location that um, was so astonishing to me because I realized it, it had been footprints in the snow. It had melted the, the whole memory, the whole ability to distinguish myself from that experience. It, it, I only saw, I only remembered it and saw what, what it was when I did it a second time. And, and, um, and then I knew I had to instantly write it down. Uh, otherwise, it, it, it would go again. Um, so, so, I mean, that to me is 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 just says something so fundamental about the difficulty of femininity and female experience, and the difficulty of writing about it. That that you know these um, and the feeling you know one has that there are there's nothing behind you. There's you know there's no history of these things having been been consistently written about there's no ancestry there's you know there's, there's no feeling of of that, you, that you're kind of continuing a, a tradition or coming out of somewhere that's been articulated you know the 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 fact is it, you know it is impossible to write <laughs> if you have a baby and so nobody writes about motherhood unless they can find someone to look after the baby and i mean that is self evident but but in terms of actually you know, the, documenting these fundamental um, parts of life for others so that others will know m more about them. And what was it about this experience that you felt hadn't been documented or...? Uh, well, I think, I mean, I do think that there's um, something in the nature of having a child that, um, you know, you think you are the only person <laughs> this has ever happened to. And, and I mean, it, it has been... I have noticed, and it has been sort of said to me on occasion, that, that each generation thinks that nothing has been written about motherhood. But I mean, the truth is that very little has been written about motherhood. And, um, sorry, I promised not to do that. Um, and, you know, when you think about the, the, the world of, you know, my mother's generation, um, where, you know, the, so, it, so it goes that the, the sort of, chain of information had had kind of broken down you know that mothers didn't tell their daughters anymore how to you know look after babies and uh and so the experts the doctor Spox, the you know so, so this stuff became written about but in in a how to do it way um which i suppose sets you up for um feelings of failure and feelings that that you're not doing it right and so I, I, I think the subject changed probably quite significantly in in the kind of mid 20th century um, and and you know on before that um, but I, I think the the situational difficulty of really really recollecting what it's like what this very first period is like you know the fact that the same person has to have the baby and write about it, and I think there's so many um, aspects of female experience that that you know have have been like that, uh, that you are both subject and author. You know, there is when you look at the reaction when the book came out back then, and you sort of compare it to the 
I would say, praise and also admiration it receives nowadays. It feels as if it was somehow, you know, written 20 years too early, mm -hmm. or at least it, it, you know, it was, it was, you know, waiting for for us to ca catch up with it. Um, but what do you feel changed in sort of the way we are mothers, but also talk about motherhood since then? Um, I don't know that anything does change. I think it, it is absolutely true that, that, that anything loses its power to shock over time. There's very, very few things that retain their power to shock. So time has an extraordinary ability to, to <laughs> um, diffuse um, that, that initial um, kind of crash of, of uh, you know, a, a cultural product into the, the established way of, of doing things and looking at things. Um, I, you know, I think that that is a, um, that's all very well uh, to shock people and to, but, but it's in a sense the, the, the kind of incompatibility of those two things, the, the really um, genuine, uh, attempt to to be accurate and truthful about motherhood that I was you know and it was hard to do it was hard to write with two children under the age of two you know that was not easy and uh, you, you're making yourself very vulnerable by doing that and it's a, a you know and you don't associate that effort because it was an effort with shock with uh, violent anger towards you with so so I, th I think that is um, another thing that I discovered about why um, female experience has been hard to write about because very often, the, you know, what, what you're trying to say, you're trying to describe unique, vulnerable, exposed episodes of being and becoming, you know, in which you are not a victim exactly, but but you're you're very very vulnerable and. If people then attack that, <laughs> not only are you uh, silenced, but and I mean this was the thing that I I hated the most about the reception to a life's work, and I used to get a lot of letters um, from all sorts of different kinds of women, um, including my mother, who wrote to me and said, as though I was not her daughter, wrote to me, <laughs> wrote to me and said, oh your book really reminded me of you know when I had a baby, <laughs> <laughs> me. <laughs> um, <laughs> But I got a lot of letters from uh, women saying that, that, that the sight of me being criticised for truthfulness discouraged them f from being truthful about their own experiences and that they felt even more isolated you know, because some people you know, find motherhood difficult. It is difficult. And, and suddenly it being proved that you're not allowed to say that, being proved very publicly, was did a form of damage that you know I, I it made me really really angry and um it was yeah far more than the damage to me uh, and did this response or even just the experience of motherhood m make you start thinking about because form later on in your writing becomes a very sort of you know central topic right how can you write in a way that will prevent truth from being you know mistaken as rudeness for mm. example um, was this something that you already started thinking about at this point in your writing life? Oh, I mean, absolutely, because, um, you know, there I was in the foothills of an experience that I realised I could not, with, with the novel, <laughs> you know, as it stood, as, it, as I understood it and as I practised novel writing, I could not put this material in a novel and uh, without falsifying it in some completely deadly way. Um, and that was, I suppose, the real beginning of me thinking, okay, so what, so what do I do? I write two different kinds of book. I write, and that is indeed what I decided to do, to, to use this memoir form, which is just um, the most dangerous form to write in. It offers you absolutely no protection um, at all. And so I guess that, in the end, really, really led me to think, why? Why can't the novel 
adapt itself to um, this whole other side of life? Um, what, what is wrong with it? Why can't it? Uh, and it's strange, right? Because when you read a life's work and even aftermath, you know, you would the classic memoir form is full of details and surfaces. You know, there will be names, there will be, you know, street names and details. And you sort of already at this point developed a technique where you are writing about yourself, but in a, in a retracted way, yeah. I would say. And still it caused anger. Mm. Why, why is that? <laughs> if I knew the answer to that, um, <laughs> I would possibly never have written it. I, luckily, I don't seem to have kind of learned um, on that score. Um, oh, I think uh, wh one of the infuriating um, criticisms of the book, because as you say, my my whole, I, you know, I mean, I wrote it very much as I would write a novel, so using exactly the same scruples and discipline and, and um, it was very much not a kind of, I'm going to get this off my chest, you know, I'm just going to write about myself because um, I can't be bothered to sort of hide it. Um, and, and the decision to, to, to just, um, yeah, withdraw the, the identifiable, the clearly identifiable world um, so that a woman reading it or indeed a man reading it could feel um, th 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 that it was about them, that, that I'm not saying, oh, my husband Martin, you know, says, or, or giving locations, or, or I wanted it to be, um, to, to retain that, that um, yeah, that, that ability that you can own it as, as your own experience, um, that universality, I guess. So, when the criticism was made that, that I hadn't given enough detail, and this criticism was very much made about aftermath as well, that I hadn't gone into the gory details, you know, I hadn't explained and given names and dates, and um, that, that was really, really frustrating. Mm. Um, because I thought, well, you know, the reason I did this was to, uh, I guess, give it independence from me and and it was the opposite of, of uh, a, a sort of exercise in narcissism or self-obsession or anything else you know i've been reading uh, naipaul's um enigma of arrivals oh well now in fact if i have a pandemic book it's that one really um, yeah okay so so okay so we need to talk about <laughs> this because I, I i was reading that and suddenly i started to think about a life's work and i was wondering why those two in a way became connected and I think it relates to the concert chapter actually that you were reading before because it seems as if, you know, just to explain, uh, Naipaul wrote this book where he's around middle-aged and he starts to remember, he's living in an English village close to the Stonehenge and he starts to sort of remember the time when he immigrated from Trinidad to England in 1950s and what that sort of, that experience did to him as a man and as a writer. And one of the things that I think he really, really describes is sort of what happens to a person when you immigrate, which is that you become, you know, chronically aware of the second place, you mm -hmm. could say. And I think that's also one of the things I love the most about your book is that you describe, you know, you call it the curse of the divided life you know, that suddenly you are not just in one place, you're dispersed, you know, mm. from the Garden of Eden, in a way. Mm. And I was wondering, have you, what did, you know, what do mothers and migrants have in common? <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, I think, I mean, what uh, Naipaul identifies about that experience is that you become well, it's, it's this chronic state of awareness. You, you cannot stop your awareness from, from working and you, um, you can't stop learning. So ev you learn every single thing you see. So, so and it, you're not selecting particularly, you're, you're just, you know, the whole adaptation, the whole effort of, of trying to belong means that you um, over, you invest too much significance in, the things that you see, whereas in fact what's happening is you are in a completely automatic state of, of trying to acquire 
knowledge, trying to acquire familiarity. Um, and I mean, that is something that, in terms of the prose that it produces, um, I guess I found that such a moving and devastating idea because I'm of my own experience of being uprooted in childhood and moving to England at the age of eight. And again, you know, not so dramatically, but, but you know, I had the wrong, I had an American accent. I, I had no sort of idea of how England worked or, or you know, and England was a much more sort of um, divided, well, <laughs> it's divided in a different way now, but um, a, a very class bound, critical, judgmental society. And, and so the, you know, Naipaul's desperation to fit in is actually partly a result of it being England that, that he moved to, I think. Um, but, you know, what I recognised reading that book was that what I had felt to be something, um, a sort of sacred quality to my memories, um, the, the level of detail that I remembered about every single blade of grass in the English village that we moved to. And I could, and for years I did, used to, to try and make myself sleep in the period when I had small children and um, being constantly woken up and couldn't go back to sleep. I used to relive the journey from our house in the back of the car to my school. And because I knew, it's, I, I knew it off by heart and I just thought, well, you know, by the time I get there, hopefully I'll be asleep. Um, by the time, you know, it's quite a long journey. And by the time I've remembered every single hedgerow, every field, every, you know, phone box. And, um, and it really was only reading Naipaul that made me question why I had remembered these things that are meaningless, <laughs> that have no value, that, that are not... And I treated them with such importance because they were what happened to me when I arrived in England. And um, so that seems to me the, the, the thing that he really amazingly um, renders um, and, and the tragedy of that knowledge, um, the, the, the knowledge of arrival um, be, being, yeah. You know, another thing he talks about is how making the move becoming an immigrant kills imagination, at least it kills his imagination. Mm. Did you have a similar experience when you became a mother? Or what does it do to, um, to you I know? Think, I think I sort of got divorced from the whole idea of imagination, <laughs> um, possibly a bit before that, but, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, the, the most stunning thing for me um, in terms of the experience of motherhood, but also uh, trying to write within or around that experience was that um, I couldn't, you know, the very first effect of it was that I could not read. So having had this baby, I could no longer read because I couldn't leave reality. Um, I was not at all interested in living in an imagined world and I needed someone to be owning and verifying their experience. I, I could only read things that were where the person said I, and they were talking about reality, not, not um, you know, people in a, in a made up story or a narrative. And I think that was another reason why it, it, it seemed to me that that was how I had to write a life's work, um, because that was all I wanted was for someone to talk to me ab about this, <laughs> to recognize what was happening. And so I think I probably wrote the book that I wanted to read, if you see what I mean. And Aftermath, um, which was published in 2012, I mean, you could describe it as a book depicting your, you know, the breakup of your marriage or the aftermath of that. You could also call it a book of iconoclasm, um, because I think when, it, when reading it, it seems that it's in this book that one of the like, major ideas of your writing ever since is introduced, which is this idea of falling out of the frame uh, you know, stopping to you know, ending the, the, the marriage with plot. Um, can you say something about what the end of your marriage did to your belief in these, you know, image stories? Um, well, I, I mean, again, it, it, uh, the, there's the same relationship between 
I mean, lots of people get divorced, and who cares if I get divorced a million times? I mean, it, you know, it really doesn't matter. It's not, it's not that, that I particularly have these things that I <laughs> need to share with. It's more that I see these, these absolutely pivotal moments where, where huge changes in awareness take place. And, yeah, for me, the, the change of awareness that took place in, in the... Um, divorce experience was about belief and it, it, it's the loss of belief in reality and the realization of how much of living relies on people being in a belief state and if you're not in that state and you don't believe you know everything from love to <laughs> uh, even creativity to an extent to political beliefs to um, you know w one of the things that that I think makes depression so, such a powerful force in people's lives potentially is that it is essentially a loss of belief in in living and um, you know that is a, a, a depressing <laughs> experience if, if you um, I suppose if, if you, I mean, it almost it suggests that you really believe in believing uh, to the extent that if you can't believe, you, you know, it's like not believing in God if you, if you really, really did believe in God um, that, that creates the state of depression. Um, so I think that uh, realization that created aftermath, um, you know, it was, it was, you know, I, I suppose I, I really mainly um, am a writer of gendered experience, and what was so gendered in that divorce moment was this feeling that that um, all of the the willingness, the kind of biological willingness <laughs> that that had been exacted from me. Um, that, that this was this was just another layer of belief about what women were meant to do and what female life was, and that even if um, you know having a child is in fact a, a, a sacred privilege, and um, which it kind of, which it is, um, that 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 this power of being able to do that had somehow been taken away from <laughs> women and, and repackaged and resold to them as a kind of inferiority and a, a kind of slavery in a sense and and um, and that, that it all runs on belief it all runs on on particular beliefs about what women feel what they feel about children you know you're not allowed to say that you feel something different and and so I guess sort of coming the second time around to this um, I, I was a bit more severe, I suppose, in aftermath than than you know. Life's work is is a funny book. It's it's trying to laugh at some of the things that that and I I did not feel like laughing um, the next time around. You know, one of the harshest I think quotes in 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 the book you s you write it looked like feminism, but was in fact male values. My parents, among others, well-meaning bequeathed me the cross-dressing values of my father and the anti-feminine values of my mother. I'm not a feminist. I'm a self-hating transvestite. What is it you're describing in the value tra transaction that you're describing in this quote? Well, I mean, the problem with Aftermath is it, it, it was quoted. Uh, I hadn't realized how, <laughs> how much I'd left the door open for you know, the partial quote, such as, I am not a feminist. I obviously am a feminist. Uh, it, it's, um, it needed some, some goodwill, you know, to be read properly that book. And I think I was describing something that is, um, that may have changed now, but, but uh, that remains completely characteristic of my generation um, of women, which is the generation whose mothers' lives and experiences are diametrically opposite to ours, and we then possibly have female children whose experiences are a lot closer to ours. Um, so, you know, to be the child of 
old womanhood, <laughs> of, of almost pre-feminist womanhood. Um, and, and my experience was that, that, you know, my mother, for, or a mother in, in of the type, um, kind of uses her, or kind of formulates her powerlessness in a, uh, as a um, form of pressure on the daughter, the new, um, so it's, it's, you know, pressure to do well, pressure to do well at school and to succeed and to come top and, and with no uh, clue as to how that's going to fit in <laughs> with all the other expectations that you will also be the old kind of woman. Um, you know, a, a person in my mother's position or that generation of women, you know, there were no female values that they could pass on to us because those values were um, the values of, of getting married at 21, changing your name, um, being at home, having children one after the other, not working. Um, th those were not values that they, they could, you know, no woman of a, you know, child in whenever it was, 1970, was going to say to their child, don't worry about your maths. <laughs> don't worry about learning, you know, because actually, you know, when you leave school, you'll just be at home cooking. So, um, you know, that, that you had to come up with a value system to go with this education that your daughter was receiving and and yeah and how did that clash with the experience of becoming a mother and you know becoming a family um what in in for me yeah how did what clash the the the, the, the clash of these you know the the, the sort of uh, the, the you could say the male values that had been passed on and then suddenly having to also be well i mean i think that part of what what it looked like what this what a life's work looked like was what it, what would be said if men had babies like if men had babies they <laughs> you know we would all know a lot more about having babies i think was the um so i guess that i i described it really from that um position a little bit of cultural entitlement of of you know i'd written already three novels they'd done well i'd won prizes and so i i suppose i felt without even thinking about it too much, that I had a platform to say things. I was allowed to write books. If I wanted to write a book about this, I was allowed to write a book about this. Little did I know. Um, but So I think that that clash was um, totally unconscious in me. And um, it, it, was, it only really revealed itself in, in what was then said when it turned out that uh, part of having a child was becoming a different kind of woman and a woman who dissimulated, a woman who said, it's great, it's wonderful, it's fantastic. <laughs> and, and some of it is fantastic, but, but the, the, the whole social contract rested on, at a certain point, women beginning to lie about how things were. It, often for very good reasons. And I mean, I've, you know, I've had a very, very complicated relationship over the years with that dissimulation because, you know, in, in certain lights, it, it has looked very much to me like courage. And in certain lights, what I do has looked like cowardice. And, um, you know, being honest about things compared to being brave about things, for instance. Um, you know, I've thought about that a lot. Um, but nonetheless, it, it's... It is a, um, a a real danger or a reality and a danger that that as you head into these very 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 you know <laughs> uh, structured historied parts of female experience that you you, you know you're not going to change it it's going to change you and um, I guess my book was my last letter to myself <laughs> saying don't let it change you you know stay who you are and part of you know the i would say the more not ecstatic books uh, parts of the book but the parts where you describe living in the aftermath right like trying to define you know also starting to 
recreate a home after having broke break in break in a home. I mean, these are the parts where you c also come to terms with this new I you know idea of having fallen out of the frame. And one of the ways you try to visualize to the reader what this state of being in the aftermath is is describing your history teacher. Uh, Mrs. Lewis, and, and can you try to describe, you know, what is it she sort of taught you about living in the aftermath? Um, so, I mean, that's sort of really the, the kind of opening bit of the book, which is trying to make the point that um, that all human experiences have bear a relationship to history, and uh, that, I mean, this is, you know, Freud, this is like basic Freud, um, which is that, that human civilization, you know, a, a human life is, is hum the development of human civilization in, in a compact form, starting with, you know, the ancient Greeks as <laughs> infancy, you know, uh, and, um, and I think my point was that, that in these, these relatively uncharted, um, areas of human experience, that it, it's hard to know which bit of history they attach to. And very often, in the case of divorce, and, and really if I kind of went back and thought about it again, I guess in the case of mother motherhood too, but I haven't thought about it in that light, um, that the links to history are really, really unclear. Um, and that's because of history, not because <laughs> not of... The, the experience itself, it's because these experiences are, are um, I, I suppose, anti-convention, um, anti, anti the, 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 um, the sort of rules, the social rules of, of, of about, you know, how things work and, and um, you know, particularly uh, the idea of um, male power as <laughs> a, a force in history. And I suppose what I could look back to was this period of being taught history at school where I had a teacher who was much more interested in, um, or for whatever reason we studied that period, in, in the, the things that happened around the collapse of the Roman Empire and the ways in which different kinds of beliefs uh, grassroots ways of, of, of passing on information or of, of preaching or of, um, you know, had in the Dark Ages, had, had their, their time. And, and um, so it's really like kind of looking through the, the, sort of going through the mirror and trying to see the other side of, of you know, the Roman Empire, say, the other side of these realities that are, that are highly, you know, they're, they're essentially sort of pa patriarchal realities and trying to find your history on that other side of it, um, of, of, of the thing that, that people know. Um, and, and to me, that was really interesting. And <laughs> I think I've made my point pretty successfully and it made people absolutely furious, so. Um. <laughs> You know, I we spoke um, in February 2020 uh, when when the third part of your outline trilogy had just um, come out. I interviewed you, and I was re you know I was listening to the the recording the other day, and I realized that I imposed a you know idea that the outline trilogy was a complete you know radical break with everything you had ever done before and i think in a way it was it was just you know echoing you know the the general response of of the trilogy but when you look at aftermath it also seems as if the 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 you know the trilogy is really just the, not just but it is the creative response to the insights you had when you were writing the other book. Yeah, absolutely. And, and can you say something about the relationship between one, like how you work yourself from one book to another or to the next? Well, I mean, sometimes, um, I mean, I wouldn't, I don't think I would write, and if I did, I wouldn't call it a memoir, but I, you know, I don't use the memoir form anymore, um, partly because I tried to find a way of resolving the two things and you know that resolution was was outline um and you know and yet you know the the you know these these kinds of 
books and in fact essays also have have this function they they can they can be really great places to work some stuff out uh without quite feeling that you're 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 taking up space in in the way that a, a, a creative or imaginative work would do you know that needs a, a reason to exist um, it seems to me that a, an essay or a memoir doesn't doesn't need a reason to exist because its its location is can be tracked to life and and um, I think that more than anything that feeling of um, there needing to be a um, a justification in terms of a location for the kinds of the kind of book that I was interested in writing. Um, you know, I don't think anyone else particularly cares about that. I really care about it. I care that that uh, that you don't by creating something just create sprawl you know like suburbs around the city that just because you want to you know write a book <laughs> you're just going to write one and you're going to kind of plonk it down without seeing how it how it what it does to the landscape how it possibly spoils other people's views or, or takes up space that someone else could be using and 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 for me particularly that is that idea of location is um completely central to saying anything worthwhile about female existence um, because you know what is the place <laughs> where is the place of of women where is it where has it been and as i said at the beginning the powerful feeling that i really thought about today of footprints in the snow you know of, of what that experience would have been if i had not written it down and what so much of of biological living you know is um unless the exhausted person who <laughs> who lives it can actually you know find a location to 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 put this stuff in um yeah so so i think the uh the relationship between um living and writing is for me, it's, it's a tightrope. It is such a tightrope to walk, and it's so easy to spoil it. It's so easy to get it wrong by thinking that, you know, something is about you when in fact it's completely not about you, and you are at its service. You know, that's how I see it. That I am at the service of, um, you know, the things, the things that I write. And when you found the way to locate you know Faye in the the trilogy how what y y when we spoke the last time you you described the trilogy as a book consisting of prose photos um, yeah that was what I wanted to get that was what and I really remember uh, it took me a long time to work it out and I um, in the end photography the idea of photography was because I was I, I couldn't see how you would um capture this this non reality this lack <laughs> because it, was, it really was a life composed of you know the post divorce life uh that that you know people are becoming more and more familiar with um it, it it's not only the sort of pain of <laughs> dismantling it, it's it's just composed of so many negatives of so many things you no longer have uh and it's very hard to make, to create a work, because essentially creation is a positive thing, a out of all those negatives. Um, so I, I think the, that, that was really where um, the idea of, of essentially allow, allowing, uh, make, making the big absence <laughs> an absence of a storyteller. Um, which was also a, a um, I guess, my way of understanding uh, what all of the things that I've sort of troubled about and picked away at, narrative, belief, subjectivity, all these, these things that I've, I've sort of found in, you know, in all these different parts of life. And I thought, well, actually, you know, the biggest one is the teller of the story, is the, you open a book and someone's telling you 
who? You know, who is that? Is that? <laughs> I mean, it's kind of maybe the writer, but it's also the writer is is believing in this this omniscient narrator, this this sort of godlike figure who happens to like know what's going on in other people's heads and also knows what happened in the past and the future and in on the other side of the world. And I thought, okay, that if you can get rid of that, um, in and yeah, photography suggested it t itself to me because the photographer and the photograph, the thing to be photographed, are, are in a much more equal relationship. You know, the, f the photographer is a person waiting for an opportunity, and reality is the opportunity. And that, that way of perceiving, of knowing that you have to wait until reality arranges itself in such a way that it gives out the most possible information about what it is, about what is going on. And, okay, so you, you think, I need to take a photo of Paris. It's like, you've got to have the Eiffel Tower in there because then, <laughs> you know, that's really simple. Then everybody will know it's Paris. And, and so that was how I started to think, was like, how, how can you make a book write itself <laughs> simply by ha waiting and, and having the right, the right things in the picture so that you don't need this narrator person? And um, one, of the, one of the people that Faye meets, it's in Outline, um, she meets a Greek publisher friend, they haven't met for several years, and um, he tells her that he lost, you know, he's had a hard time, his publishing house closed, he has lost his belief in the story of improvement, and then he says, it even affected, infected the novel, though perhaps now the novel is infecting us back again so that we can expect of our lives what we have come to expect of our books. And, and it seems it's a paragraph where you also really address the issue of, of not just progress, but also the idea of development in storytelling. Mm. And what is the problem with progress, you know, from a novelistic point of view? Um, that it doesn't exist, <laughs> I guess. And uh, I mean, I think one of the things that the pandemic has been so interesting uh, in that the idea of progress and improvement, the idea of the story rattling on, you know, to, to, you know, everyone, more or less, the vast majority of people have experienced a breakdown in reality, a breakdown of, of and, and so I suppose a breakdown of what we call reality, which suddenly it's obvious w was, a, a, a yeah a narrative um, in which we believed we had to you know we, we believed in in uh, meaningful developments um, we believed in beginnings middles and ends and and happy ends and um, I think that's been a a massive shock and a strain for a lot of people I think it's probably created um, a lot of discouragement and <laughs> depression and people thinking well. If it was, you know, if it was just a story, you know, what was the point? If it could all just stop, and and I, I've heard that a lot from people um, that that they don't want to believe in, or well, they're struggling to believe in reality again, and to kind of put their hearts into it and care about things, because it's really that. It, it's um, I suppose ways to to make you care about the story of your own life. It's so interesting you use the word care because I just read an essay by Adam Phillips, um, the English uh, psychoanalytic, yeah. and, he, and he calls it the cure of psychoanalysis. And I, again, thinking about your writing, in the text he tries to sort of trail how psychoanalysis has been thinking about the idea of cure basically ever since its, its founding. And, and he's Problem problematizes it because he says that you know the idea of cure first of all it, it adds you know it just adds to this you know idea or image repertoire we have in society because there is an you know an assumption of what you know the outcome will mm. be and there is also putting the psychoanalyst on a pedestal where he or her knows what you know the good life is and also what um, basically the the patient you know, what they dream of, what they desire, who they are. They know the, the patient better. And instead, he quotes Winnicott, and he says that actually Winnicott 
apparently wrote that uh, the word cure evolved from the word care. Mm. And it started to degenerate in the 17th century uh, when we started becoming obsessed about health mm. and, you know, remedies instead of asking... Them. And things getting better, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so so, so he, he, he suggests a reversal, basically. Mm. Um, and reading that, it seemed that your writing... It, it was basically talking about the stuff your writing is talking about. And I wanted to ask you how... Psychoanalysis, is that something that has inspired you, influenced you? So Winnicott was a huge influence on me, and particularly, I mean, he, I quote him a lot in, in the life's work, um, or I mentally quote him if I don't actually quote him. I think I do actually quote him quite a lot. Um, it, it, I suppose the thing, the, the time when that really, really uh, mattered to me uh, as well, was in the period of writing this book, and it mattered not because I had ever had psychoanalysis or was intending to have it, it was because of it as a language system. And what was starkly apparent to me was that you were allowed, in this language of psychoanalysis, to say the most extraordinary things about motherhood. And Winnicott says them. So, you know, the, the quote that I have in the book, typical Winnicott quote, quote, he says, the problem is that the mother hates the baby before the baby knows that, that it's, he is capable of being hated. Okay, that's a classic Winnicott line. <laughs> and Winnicott was a, you know, revered child. Um, I mean, he was in, in, in terms of, um, you know, English, British society at a particular moment he, he really built you know sort of big parts of, of what was good about that in terms of you know understanding um children and um so I was like okay this is wild like <laughs> you can you really can say anything um and I think that was where I missed the warning signs in in <laughs> in this book that maybe you know not everybody had read Winnicott and um or <laughs> Um, so I think my, my real uh, sort of relish for, for psychoanalytic writing started there and then I read Freud, you know, endlessly and um, Jung and I mean Jung's not so fun to read but um, and then you know lots of things, Alice Miller, you know, good, good stuff about how, how to treat other people, how to treat children, how to, you know, so, so it's these... Um, writings that go so much further into uh, the entrails of living than a novel ever does, ever. You would never read a, 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 a novelist really, really morally grappling with um, true human impulses, other than Dostoevsky. He's, he's probably the only one who, who would really dare to, to grapple in that way um, with, with not in a caring about... And the main point about psychoanalysis is that it is incompatible with religion. And, and that is, you know, its absolute strength is it is not... It isn't written with an unconscious, unconscious Judeo-Christian concept of reality. It, it, you know, that is the radical thing about it. It's looking at the world without that. And, you know, Freud... Freud's completely hilarious sort of attempt to understand what religious feeling is. When he says, well, sometimes I, <laughs> I get an oceanic feeling. <laughs> is it that? But then he goes, no. I, in fact, I, just, I can explain the oceanic feeling, you know, which is a desire for religion or a desire that my life be meaningful and that I correspond with, you know, some, something greater than myself. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, th you know, these things, especially if you've grown up oppressed by completely pointless authoritarian uses of you know religious rules which i was um it, you know that is a great liberation <laughs> there in the adam phillips text he, he quotes a letter that freud sent to jung where he's he, he writes to him um i need to stop thinking about curing people and just think about you know learning something and earning money yes yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah. but 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 going back to 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 them and the you know the big insight of how reality is constructed i mean uh, reading your books it's one long exercise in trying to get used to this idea but 
because your books aren't self-help books, you don't really, you know, tell <laughs> the reader what they should do with that. But but if we, you know, go back to to not your own life, but but your thinking life, how does one learn to cope with that realization? Because you, as you said before, many people experienced that for the first time during Corona. Um, oh, what about sort of this idea that loss, that of, loss of belief in reality? Um, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what the answer to that is. I think um, it's something that I kind of, uh, you know, it's become completely central to, to the way that I think about the world and... and um, I think I get a feeling sometimes that there's a sense in in you know my readership to the extent that I have one or, or people sort of critiquing my work favorably there's a little sense of let her deal with it <laughs> let, let's just let her deal with that problem of of you know um so I don't know. I don't know whether it's a um, something that people are relieved to have pointed out for them, um, but so that they don't have to um, worry too much about it. Um, because in fact, there's there's no uh, there's not an awful lot you can do with um, belief. Uh, it's loss. It's gain. It's presence. Um, you know, one of the most infuriating things I am occasionally infuriated by um, this thing that I do which is writing things and and other people reading them and then not understanding them which you know I don't know why that but but you know the thing that's been said to me so much about second place is oh but you said you didn't believe in novels and fiction and stories anymore and and you know here it is this is a novel with a story and and um, you know that that uh, you know I'm not proselytizing for anything. I'm I'm not. I'm just trying to to help myself and anyone else who cares um, to to have m more power of self. I suppose more control over existence and and destiny. Of more control over individuality because for me individuality is the. Uh, single and only value and um, it is the one thing by which you can always navigate and we give it up so easily um, and then you know my I suppose the story that I've told across so many books is is almost a, a, a sort of a bit of an odyssey of giving it up <laughs> into these various structures and then knowing that you have to get it back and you have to break up it all in order to get that thing back and, and resume your, your rightful you know, place on, on, on the road. Um. There is a sentence in, in second place that moved me very much. Um, why do we live so painfully in our fiction? Why do we suffer so from the things we ourselves have invented? And the main character in the book, M, you call her. What are the fictions she is living with and suffer from? Oh well, that's <laughs> she's uh, she's quite late in life at this point. So or not late in life, but I mean she's you know the 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 I guess the the sort of reality well not really reality but the the um, terrain of living that I really wanted to write about but absolutely could not see how I was going to do it um, was this idea of um, sort of female extension beyond its own beyond the purposes of femininity and you know the question of what which was a question I asked m myself at a certain point and that's usually where I start a, a thinking and writing process where, where I think, okay, well, I'm doing this, and is anybody else doing it? And um, so my question was, what am I for? Like, why, what, why do I continue to exist when, you know, my biological purpose is done, and yet I'm given this 
is it so that I can just wait for my children to have children and then I have to go and look after those? Or is that what sort of biology is up to here? Um, but, you know, not really. And, and this, this post, post everything feeling um, that didn't have any, didn't seem to have any structure or any features or, or it just seemed to be in terms of how women exist in the culture in, in later phases of life. It seemed just to be sort of lots of women alone kind of wandering around trying to sort of give it, it a meaning or structure and sort of make the best of it. And, and um, th you know, there's no organized sort of midlife crisis like there is for men where you get a motorbike and you have an affair with a 20 year old or whatever. You know, there's just none of, none of that, you know, material. And, um, you know, the, the reason I fell with glad cries on, on um, the, the structure for second place was that, that it, it precisely married these two things that I was really wondering about. One is that the woman wandering around in, in sort of later middle age really can look back on her femininity and think, you know, <laughs> what was that for and and i have been made use of i have been made use of as a woman and that you know i and talk about belief states i believed you know like a good girl i believed all along in love in loving my children in having them in, in you know uh and i think at a certain point it can really seem that you have been exploited um without you know and you've like said okay <laughs> you've sort of gone gone along with it and at exactly the same moment um i really think a revaluing of male entitlement and privilege um can occur and that what i wanted was the woman looking giving the backward glance and suddenly seeing it all in a different light seeing at the same time that part of what has sustained her in her possible exploitation or her, her is art is the the ability to read to listen to music to look at paintings and feel meaning being given to her life feel that she has at least in some sense been understood been expressed by artists and art and meanwhile the artist, <laughs> the male, you know, and she invites to yes, but I mean the figure of the artist, which is sort of where I started, was like, you know, how is it that we, uh, you know, that person, that male cultural icon, is is, um, is so badly behaved, is so selfish, is so, uh, you know, the stories, of, and I mean, I started thinking about this because I wrote. A, something about Lucy and Freud for, for the New York Times in that light as, as like, you know, because really the question is, oh, you know, should we stop looking at paintings by these people? I mean, it, you know, is, is it going to come to that? And, you know, I don't know, maybe it should. Um, but, but the, yeah, the, the, the abandoning of children, the abusing of women, the, the complete indulgence in, you know, every desire and, and whim. Um, and, and that's... You know, if you look at these two people, <laughs> the Lucy and Freud person and the, the woman going, oh, what was all that about? You have quite an interesting, uh, you know, that woman can say to that man, do you consider that I am a woman? Uh, do, you know, here I am sort of post everything, post biology. Um, in your eyes, am I still a woman? And uh, that was the situation that I wanted to really get at and and in the case of Mabel Dodge Luhan and and her artists <laughs> you know that was the situation that she endlessly endlessly put herself in and and when you put the book away you really do have the feeling that you know men have freedom and women have fates in a strange way um, but but do you I mean, you addressed this topic before, you know, if, if, again, when I picked up this book, I thought, oh, this is the first time you're addressing the topic of, of aging and what it means to be a female body aging. But actually, in a life's work, there is this short paragraph where you talk about Natasha from War and Peace, uh, Tolstoy's yeah, book, and, and, and the, the 
idea of how she's sort of written out of the book. And when you start thinking about it, I, the, the fate of women in fiction is, is gru you know, gruesome and, and, and quite repetitive because you also have Anna Karenina with Kitty the same thing happens. It's always something with their eyes. Mm. The, the yes, the whole story was very sad <laughs> when <laughs> women <laughs> became <laughs> stopped being romantic heroines. Yeah, they, 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 they have like, they, they, they're in the book for a while and they're, they become secondary characters. And that's also what seems so radical, I would even say, in the project you've embarked on now with this book and that you might continue, I don't know. but but when you become a mother to an infant, you're still the one telling the story. But the female figure that you are trying to describe now is someone who doesn't... Yeah, is, oh, who is do, yeah, who doesn't <laughs> even have a, a part in the story. Um, and, I mean, I guess there was so much I, I wanted to say about that. Um, and yet it's so, it's another of those things that's composed of absences. Um, it's, a, it's a very, you know, without reattaching everything to life <laughs> again, um, it, it's, it's hard to get at it. And I didn't, you know, these things are lost in, in being um, attached to life in, in the, the sort of fundamentally bourgeois way that a, that a novel has to function, it has to, Put its characters in the world, and and you know, and there there you get distance, and um, and okay, what you know, a character can function as a as a as Dickens still functions very well as a type, you know, as a way of understanding a type in society, or possibly even a a, um, a phase of life, or or but you know, not these kinds of phases of life. They're they're so universal and yet so hidden um, and so unarticulated um, that, that it's a, you know it is a very difficult business to to represent them without personalizing them and and what do you feel you haven't gotten onto the page of, of, of that experience in this book um, well I don't know because I don't know how it um, I mean it's interesting because I I decided at a very late moment to which is what I always do when I finish a book, I think no one's going to understand it. And in this case, I thought they're really not going to understand it. And I put a note and afterward, a little paragraph saying that the book is indebted to this other book. And I'm, I do wonder whether I was wrong in doing that because if that hadn't, I mean, every single conversation I've had about this book, it always has to go through the, the question of Mabel Dodge Luhan, who in fact, you know, the, the book is actually not really anything to do with her, and and it 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 takes her. It just took her ability to to make an example of something, um, which is the kind of thing writers do all the time, and they don't tell anybody about it. So so, um, yeah, I wonder whether actually, if I had not um, disclosed that origin, whether in fact the strangeness of the book would be doing a lot more work and people would be going, you know, would be made to think about it in, well, they would just supply a lot more of the, the, the filling in and thinking because, you know, if there's one thing I know about writing and reading, it's literally the minute you give people a fact. It's like when there's a TV on in a room and, you know, you can't stop watching it. It's, yeah. it's a magnet. And the minute you give someone a fact, they're magnetized for obvious reasons by, by that. And it starts to... It just conditions the way everybody um, then understands reality. Do you sometimes consider revising your work? Because one thing is regretting decisions made, but you know, painters, some painters, you, you know, spend a lot of time, re you know, either yeah, creating. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Is, uh, could you imagine removing this information for? Example? Oh, uh, that wouldn't be revising. That is. Uh, it, it's going out. Yeah, <laughs> I think it, I think it will go for the paperback. I don't think I'll. Um, I'll have it in there. I'll, I'll, I'll let that rabbit run. Um, give it an opportunity to, yes, possibly mystify the book a bit more. Um, because in fact, the book is mysterious, and the mystery is not explained by Mabel Dodge Luhan. Um, so, yeah, it's interesting. You you mentioned 
Lucien Freud before, and I actually found a quote from a text you wrote, not about him, but about Celia Paul and Cecily Brown, and 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 well, and about him. Yeah, and also yeah. about him. Um, I'm just going to quote from from the text. You ask, can a woman artist, however talented, however disciplined, ever attain a fundamental freedom from the fact of her own womanhood? Must the politics of femininity invariably be accounted for, whether by determinedly ignoring them or by deliberately confronting them? The latter is a fateful choice that can shape an artist's life and work, but does the former, the avoidance of oneself as a female subject, inevitably compromise the expressive act? How do you answer this question at this point in well, I mean your I life? I went, it, it, it is the fork in the road. <laughs> um, I went one way, you know, at a certain point in my life and, and a lot of other people went the other way. And um, I, I don't know what the final adding up of that is. Um, I don't know whether the... the women writers who who have not <laughs> sullied themselves with you know all of these difficulties and and um whether in the end it is you know i don't know the answer to the question is it do do you compromise um you know your gift your talent uh, in the end if you um and i mean it's a very it's 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 a question for for outsiders. It's a question for women and you know others like Naipaul, like Lawrence. Um, how much do they try to f they ditch, <laughs> you know, the unpleasant aspects of of who they are in order to to to, to try and join the conversation and fit in with with the men. Um, yeah, it, it, I suppose I believe that that. Um, you, particularly in writing, more in writing than in any other art, I think, um, the, the life you live uh, it is, if you don't live right, <laughs> you will lose your um, ability to, to write and uh, living wrongly. And in fact, this probably is true of visual artists too. Um, and there's so many ways of doing that once your work is out in the world you know caring too much of about the surface of it about you know the fact that it is out in the world um but i think for women um you know there there is a it is a, or, you know and it's now becoming a, a question in identity generally which is just because i'm this thing does that mean that i have to devote you know <laughs> my entire writing career to it you know aren't, aren't i free aren't i free to just talk about whatever i want to and and um no you know my answer is no um my answer is you you unfortunately <laughs> you uh you are born into you were born into something that that um has some injustice to attached to it and um you have to, as you would if you walked past it in the street, you have to do something about it. Before we finish, you are going to read, but before that, I promise to say that after the talk, um, you'll be signing books outside, and you can all go and buy a copy of the book and have a, a, a signature. Um, so, do you want to read? I'm just going to read the first couple of pla pages of um, this very strange book. <laughs> I am, in fact, very fond of. Um, I once told you, Jeffers, about the time I met the devil on a train leaving Paris, and about how after that meeting, the evil that usually lies undisturbed beneath the surface of things rose up and disgorged itself over every part of life. It was like a contamination, Jeffers. It got into everything and turned it bad. I don't think I realized how many parts of life there were until each one of them began to release its capacity for badness. I know you've always known about such things and have written about them, even when others didn't want to hear and found it tiresome to dwell on what was wicked and wrong. Nonetheless, you carried on building a shelter for people to use when things went wrong for them too. And go wrong, they always do. Fear is a habit like any other and habits kill what is essential in ourselves. 
I was left with a kind of blankness, Jeffers, from those years of being afraid. I kept on expecting things to jump out at me. I kept expecting to hear the same laughter of that devil I heard the day he pursued me up and down the train. It was the middle of the afternoon and very hot, and the carriages were crowded enough that I thought I could get away from him merely by going and sitting somewhere else. But every time I moved my seat, a few minutes later, there he'd be, sprawled across from me and laughing. What did he want with me, Jeffers? He was horrible in appearance, yellow and bloated with bloodshot, bile-colored eyes. And when he laughed, he showed dirty teeth with one entirely black tooth right in the middle. He wore earrings and dandyish clothes that were soiled with the sweat that came pouring out of him. The more he sweated, the more he laughed. And he gabbled nonstop in a language I couldn't recognize, but it was loud and full of what sounded like curses. You couldn't exactly ignore it, and yet that was precisely what all the people in the carriages did. He had a girl with him, Jeffers, a shocking little creature, nothing more than a painted child who was barely clothed. She sat on his knee with parted lips and the soft gaze of a dumb animal while he fondled her, and nobody said or did a thing to stop him. Of all the people on that train, was it true that the one most likely to try was me? Perhaps he followed me up and down the carriages to tempt me into it. But it was not my own country. I was only passing through, going back to a home I thought of with secret dread. And it didn't seem up to me to stop him. It's so easy to think you don't matter all that much at the very moment when your moral duty as a self is most exposed. If I'd stood up to him, perhaps all the things that happened afterwards wouldn't have occurred. But for once I thought, let someone else do it. And that is how we lose control over our own destinies. <laughs>